Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologies for uh, a slight delay in starting our program. Um, we had a bit of a technical glitch, but we sorted now. I think without further ado, um, we're going to hit straight on to the topic of today, where we are looking at um, reforming teams for high performance and excellence. I, and, and I think most people will agree with me when we looking at the time we're at, um, challenging time we're at, facing various challenges, uh, maybe caused by COVID-19 as popularly phrased, but I think everything cannot be blamed to COVID-19 solely. But at the end of the day, companies and businesses need to be functional, need to be productive, need to be delivering, need to be still engaging their clients. At the centerpiece of all this, we regard teams as uh, as fulcrum and or as cornerstones of success. So today, um, Mr. Mbelase Delane, as I call him, uh, Mr. Tembo will be talking to us on how can leaders um, reform teams to ensure that they are uh, not only effective, but they are also excelling in their delivery. Mr. Velasa, without wasting much time, I will hand over to you to take us through the presentation for today. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome again. And I'm sorry that we had a glitch, but we are back online. And thank you for connecting. And again, within an hour, there is likely one can do, but we will be teasing a few things regarding how, as we lead organizations, we can build high performing teams in times that are like this, times that are challenging, complex, and that are full of complexity. So let me take you forward. And the first thing I want to share is an African saying, which is not on my screen or my slides, which says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk together. I think that saying is befitting at today when we look at organizations. If we are able to bring the energy of teams in organizations, we are likely to walk far, even if we may seemingly not be walking fast. Meaning walking far means we shall sustain ourselves, we shall build resilience, we shall exist longer term. And just another saying which could follow that one is the one we see there that the world is changing fast. And as this writer says, Rupert Murdoch says that it's no more now the big that beat small anymore. It's the first that are going to survive. So while we are working on teams, we should also be able to pick up pace and make our organizations be able to work faster, think faster, decide faster and pull everyone together to work as a team because the world continues to become complex. It continues to be demanding, demanding us to connect more amongst each other. And it requires us to be much more sophisticated, much more competent, and to be able to manage our organizations as interconnected because the world too, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, it's caught up in an escapable sense or reality of mutuality that is interrelated or causes structures to be interrelated and to work together. Now, teams, in my experience, are life in themselves and they carry memories that we can narrate and talk about. Teams carry experiences of us as individuals and teams are able to provide us best areas of looking at the spots at which we are able to share those memories. And on my slide, I use sports as an example, either rugby, 
soccer, athletics, or any sport that requires playing as a team. And I'm sure that many of us would pick one or two of the sports. And remember individuals in those sports, whether it's the great Pele, or it's Mohammed Ali, or it's Jomo Sono, or it's Ace Nsoleng, or it's Tine Lada. If you reflect to these individuals, you are likely to accept that we remember them for what they did individually, but how they impacted on teams. And one of the elements that I can narrate is that most of these players were intelligent. They were strategic. They were responsive. And they were always ready to read the game and understand the mood of the game and understand the pace of the game and also understand the positioning of all people in their teams and understand the strengths of each person and be able to play the game according to the strengths and these weaknesses of the teams. And they were able even to change the mood, like Ace Nsuelengo, for example, would change the pace of the game and change the mood of the game in his own advantage. Now that sums up how, as individuals, we play a role within our teams, which requires that we are able to communicate, to be in conversation that are clear and understood by the people that we work with. That we are able to create and analyze and distribute scarce resources according to the strength of the team and so that the team is positioned in a complex and changing world. As I was using the individuals in these sports, you would agree that they needed to create trust so that they are trusted within the context of a team to share their wisdom and to share their art of playing and to be allowed to appropriately provide playing methodologies or systems in organizations I would say we provide standard operating systems. We provide policies, we provide strategies, we provide frameworks, we provide guidelines. But all these things cannot work if they are not appropriate to the strength and the competencies of the people within your team that you would be able to understand who they are, where they do best and where they need your support. And lastly, teams must create relationships that provide quality, quality of mind, quality of technicalities and ability, and the quality of presence of being within the teams. Now let's look at the dynamics of teams when I've just laid down the intro around teams. The dynamics of teams require synergy. And I say three things are important when you build synergy. It's ability to be aware, aware about the team, its context, its strength, its nature of the game that it plays or nature of the business that it runs. The second thing is acknowledgement. Because sometimes we can be aware, but lack a sense of acknowledgement, which comes from leaders and managers with an ability to be humble, to have humility and acknowledge the strength of others. And then lastly, it's ability to be able to act, to decide and to be decisive. In the coronavirus, there is a debate at the moment whether the president has been undermined or the president is leading or whether Minister Zuma, Jamini uh, Zuma is doing whatever they say he's, she is doing. My argument is that we have a team at the moment pushed by coronavirus and the crisis that has a, a sense of awareness 
has a sense of acknowledging its strengths and has a sense of decisiveness to act without competing or positioning to each other. That's just a by the way in our reality. So what are the things that teams require to be synergistic? They need to recognize the potential of individuals within the team, but they need to build open communication that is neither directed by hierarchy or by titles or by positions, but is directed by the importance of information and the need of information at a particular time to create what many people call meaningful conversation, clarity of purpose, and understanding the end in mind in terms of results. Teams must be also able to identify collective expectation of individuals and also of groups or people in the team and be able to create commitment of the individuals within the team, commitment to play the game, commitment to work together, commitment to support each other and commitment to work harder even if it means never sleeping if the team is affected. That means we need to share the skills and the experiences and be honest to each other to give feedback, but also to delegate to each other if there is a need to delegate. And we must also ensure that everybody understand what roles do they play and what responsibilities they have. But defining roles and responsibilities should not create hierarchies, should not create silos. It should create roles that are played in the context of being together and being able to identify common purpose, common direction, and understanding the results that we want to create. That means we should be able to act, execute, decide, in a focused and energetic way that harnesses the passion of us individually, but also of us or of people as a group or as an organization. Therefore, in the current scenario we are in, we are called to learn new behaviors and new styles of becoming members of a team with an ability to sustain ourselves throughout a crisis at the moment is the coronavirus crisis where organizations are pained and struggling to operate in a norm, learning in what many are calling a new norm. Just a few things that I would tease, I'm not going to stay long, but if we want to build synergy in our teams, we should understand the model of communication that Grinder and as Sandler are sharing with us that 70% of our way of talking and communication is about the words we share, but 38% of what we say depends on my tone and my pronunciation uh, of the English that I'm speaking or any language you speak. But more so, we should understand that when we are in an interconnected world, and we are connected with teams either through Zoom or through Skype, we miss the 55% of the body language. We must then pay more attention to how we connect and how we speak and how we enhance clarity of communication by the way we speak on the 38% and on the 7% and build new signs or new ways of understanding our body language. I think this slide is at the core of enhancing understanding and team dynamics and leaders better pay attention to understand that it's not what they say that matter, it's how they say and it's at what point do they say what they say. The other slide says that when we work as teams, we must learn to see each other. When I see you and you see me, and when we both see each other properly, we are able to move forward better, faster, and with clarity. So everything we do depends on the quality of my thinking 
it also depends on the quality of my attention attention to each other attention to the members of the team and attention to the clarity of the roles so my thinking and my quality of attention determines the quality of the team and the team's understanding so these two slides are very important the technology of communication and the technology of seeing and paying attention now let's move on and look at what many of you know and i'm not going to spend a lot of time because you all understand different levels of teams you know what forming is about performing but i've added two things there i've ex added excelling and sustaining these are not hierarchical these are fluid sense of team maturity and they are all played at different levels there may be pockets in your team that demonstrate excellence there may be pockets in your team that demonstrate a lower level of forming where there is still a lot of tensions a lot of competition a lot of differences a lot of positioning there may be components in your team that show a storming where com conflicts are playing out and disagreements are playing out what is important as you lead a team is that you are able to sense where people are in these levels that i've put there and you need to know what do they need at each level what skills do they need what empowerment do they need what training do they need what mentoring do they need what support do they need and what coaching do they need so in other words a leader of a team or a player within a team needs to know all these phases of team maturity and be able to unpack each phase and provide a strength of supporting the team but at the end of the team every team must excel to what it does as others say it must perform at a superior level and provide superior performance and get the best rewards that it can and also be acknowledged appropriately but organizations live beyond as we see now many organizations folding they were not formed to fold up they were formed to live beyond themselves to be able to provide services that they provide to their own clients therefore as teams we must also be able to measure what we do and create impact of what we do and understand how the clients we support enjoy the services that we provide and that will be dependent on the standards we create and the measures that we demonstrate for ourselves to produce the best results that we can so pay attention where is your team what support it requires what training it requires and what mentoring it requires and what skills will it need at each level to move on and become a superior performing team the other thing is that teams need to build competencies to excel the competencies are things like our 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 skills expertise and the one thing important in a team is a sense of connection that is important how can we build a sense of togetherness a sense of synergy the second one is curiosity being able to suspend high levels of judgment and embrace uncertainty within the team while we are building towards a common agenda because if we create a hype around our judgments and therefore we fail to bring unity within the team or a sense of cohesion and this is a very difficult area to suspend judgment because as human beings by nature we are judging human beings 
but we should be able to be aware that the lesser we judge, the better we build towards common purpose. And the other thing, I've already touched on awareness, but I'm going to say awareness of sustained collaboration and trust is important. And it should drive teams to be able to thrive on paradox, to be able to thrive on complexity and understanding their differences and understanding other people's weaknesses and also living in conflict perspectives and being able to remain in the bigger picture. Even if we are in a paradox, we should keep raising our voices up and raising our awareness up and raising our presence up, not in a negative sense, but building up collective responsibility. The last two, it's about constructive depolarization. And that is a very important, as I was talking about Aysen Swelengo or Tinej Radla or Jomosono, if I use soccer as an example, you'll realize that those players were calm all the time. They were calm, they were able to be collected, collective, and they were able to create a presence that doesn't surprise people. We should, as members of teams, being able to build amongst us individuals that can calm us down and make sure that we are collected and we are settled, we are not emotional. And they can help us to weigh the storm and to create a sense of direction when there is commotion or when there is panic. And I would say at the moment, Minister Mkiza, I'm not trying to be political, but that's what we are all called to see. Minister Mkize has that sense of calmness, that sense of collectiveness, that sense of assurance, that sense of distilling facts from perceptions and is able to keep us together. I'm not saying he's 100%, but I'm just using him as an example of being constructively depolarizing in a situation and helping people to focus. At the end of the day, authority is important within teams, but it is not the authority that is top down. It is the authority that is within, that is able to influence, to inspire, to aspire, to motivate, to shape scenarios and different dynamics and give us a sense of possibility and model what is great. Those are competencies which for me are critical to build excellence within teams. Let's move on to an important and a very interesting subject that when you lead in a team, and again, I'm not talking about whether you are a CEO or a manager. I'm talking about all of us as members of a team playing a leadership role. We should be able to provide rhythm to provide energy, to provide grace, and to provide flow. So let's look at that. Rhythm, very interesting. Once an orchestra captures the conductor's vision, it is obvious by a smart that the power of the performance of the orchestra reaches excellence. Organizations are like that. They're just like an orchestra. They need flow, they need smile, they need energy. And we as leaders and members of teams, we must ask ourselves, that we provide and generate a smile in the faces of members of our teams. Can we generate energy? Can we sustain in our teams what I would call meaningful dialogue? In other words, we create culture in our teams of being engaged intellectually, being engaged in reasoning, and being engaged in innovation, and being engaged in being stretched to new ideas, and being able to manage and sustain partnerships amongst ourselves 
and amongst organizations. Being able to identify and develop champions because champions are not identified through positions or titles. Champions are amongst us. It may be the lowest member of the organization who becomes a champion of a team. It could be, if I use a soccer scenario again, it could be a goalkeeper or it could be a striker or it could be someone at the center of our play who becomes the champion. We must also be able to build stories that excite us, that highlights in us successes, highs and lows. And those stories carry the legacy of organizations, carry ownership and carry accountability. We should be able to develop, as I've said earlier, systems that drive teams. And I think this is one element in managing and leading organizations that post COVID-19 is going to be a challenge. What systems are we creating now that will not be the same systems we have used before that will encourage collaboration, will encourage inclusion, will encourage integration, and will encourage champions within, not champions in positions, but champions within teams and champions within organizations and reward them appropriately. That is the greatest challenge that human resource practitioners are going to be facing moving beyond the coronavirus phases or moving beyond the lockdown periods that we are currently in. How do we change systems to support organizations to create distant virtual teams and create flow and bring a smile within organization and be able to measure these and provide new financial models of paying people, rewarding people and acknowledging people differently while you don't see them and while they work in their own workspaces at their own homes. These are challenges that we are going to face as we move forward. The next thing is how do we embed within teams a culture, not just an incident or a phase that disappears, comes in and goes. How do we sustain a new culture? That culture will start from creating personal mastery, creating individuals within teams that lead themselves. How that is done, organizations need to invest in building personal mastery because a team is strong based on the individuals of the team. You will not have a strong team if you have got work individuals. You can't have a strong Springbok team if you've got weak players. You can't have a strong Bafana, Bafana team if you've got weak players. You need strong personal mastery built individual in the team. The second thing, you need social mastery. These individuals must be able to read and be flexible to relate to each other emotionally, mentally, and have a sense of achievement that build social mastery, understanding their context, understanding their clients, understanding the people that they serve, and understanding the competitors in the context of their operation as an organization. The third thing is that we must build what I call stretch. We must be able to challenge each other every day, challenge each other every moment, every minute, every time to work better than what we are doing today. At the same time, create harmony. At the same time, create creativity at the same time deliver on the goals that we have agreed. We must also be able to create energy, create the smile that Jack Welsh talks about. The late Jack Welsh was able to create energy, create a smile in organizations. 
and not bossy people around, not threaten people around. When you enter a room as a team player or as a team member or as a leader of a team, people must be relaxed, must feel inspired, must feel energized, must remain on the edge, but being able to look forward to work together with you. We must also create holicism, head, heart, feet, and guts, and create in all these things a sense of alignment, a sense of meaning, and a sense of team imperatives, more over and above personal interest. Let me repeat that. Alignment will be built when within a team, we are able to become less important as individuals and the team becomes more important. And what we have agreed as a team becomes imperative, not what I wanted to build. And I think that is what the cabinet is trying to play at the moment. How does that work? It works when we are able to build self-leadership. And I've talked about that. It works when we are able to build leadership that creates influence amongst itself. Not just leading and managing, but being of influence individually, being of influence within the team, be, being of influence in the organization, and being also effective in tasks. Task delegated, task executed, task accounted for, task measured in terms of agreements of what was supposed to be done and tasks that are measured in terms of impact to the clients, to the organization, and to the environment. When we do that, at the end of the day, we shall be able to build performing teams. And that is what we are all looking for. We're not just playing within teams just for the sake of playing. Quotation tells it all. When knowing others may be intelligence, but knowing yourself is wisdom. But mastering others in terms of their strengths and mastering yourself is true potential of leading. So what is key for me in this quotation is intelligence, knowing others. Now that is what will build high performing teams. If I again use the example of one of the greatest coaches that I've seen, Wooden, who coached the greatest basketball team in the world, he would say that teams work not to win, but they work to have fun. So while we do want to win, we must create in teams a sense of joy, a sense of enjoyment, and a sense of fun. When there is joy, fun, and enjoyment, winning becomes automatic. Winning happens. But when you focus on winning all the time, sometimes you become very destructive and you end up not playing to the strength of your team. We know many teams in the world that have got the best players collectively, but they don't win games. They don't win games because they've not created fun. They've not created synergy. They've not created joy. So teams need to build this aggressive sense of growth, but that has got the simplicity of fun in it so that people can play and enjoy working within teams. The other thing is that teams must be able to play to their strengths of generational shifts, mixing each other to be able to sustain teams for the future. Generational mix is important in our organizations. Generational mix is important to build innovation, to build energy, but also to build strengths for success. But the last two are important because as we are caught up today in lockdowns, 
we need to build technology that supports us, that support virtual teams, that support us working from home, that support us to work in multiple environments, that supports us to challenge our system and also to have multiple accountability. I argue, and this will disturb some people, I argue that moving forward beyond the coronavirus, we should allow our employees to work in more than one organizations because you are not going to keep your employees 100% as before. They may work 50% and still deliver everything that you want. And they can be contracted to somebody else to work another 50% and they provide the support that was required. But you pay them fully and they get paid also on another side because they work from home. They don't have to be in a desk or in an office. They can work in a mobile setting. Now that is going to challenge many organizations. Organizations are also going to be challenged that they don't need to own buildings. They don't need to see teams in offices, but they will be seeing teams virtually through technology. And they will be able to provide that for their employees. Therefore, that is the challenge that teams are facing or organizations are facing moving forward. Are we ready? Are we able to change the work settings and create different ways of working and provide support to our employees that make them deliver on the promises that they have, even if they are not in our offices? This means. Are we ready to widen the circle of influence, distribute power and build a legacy, create connectivity, define context, embrace empowerment and effectiveness and change differently? And at the end of the day, create what I call communities of conversation and action and build impactful confidence within our organizations that are shared, no more centralized? Are we able to build the skills of the future that are about creativity, the skills of the future that are about mobilizing, organizing in a flexible manner and cultivating or capacitating people to work in terms of collective intelligence. These are three areas of competencies that future organizations require if they want to build teams. Creative leaders, mobilization or organizing, and also collective intelligence. Moving on, the future requires multiple team skills. The future requires building positive mindset. The future requires challenging each other, stretching. The future requires building character. The future requires creating readiness in our organizations to build teams, developing these teams. In other words, when you want to create a team culture, you must create readiness. You don't just say it has happened. You must orientate people. You must put them on boarding. You must make them understand what will change. You must create support to create these teams. And such support must be simple and clear manuals or clear rituals or new ways of behaving and discipline. We must build guidelines. We must take people through orientation to be able to manage what we are doing now as we are talking uh, in a webinar environment. How do you locate? How do you raise your voice? Or how do you clock in? Or how do you ask a question? How do you read body language? And how do you ensure that everybody understands? So as we move on in our organizations, we must be conscious. We can't just believe that teams are built. We must be deliberate. We must be intentional. 
and we must work with people, technology, and also as groups. As I conclude, because you may have many questions, I want to argue that today, organizations, leaders who lead organizations are no more called to create followers, but they are called to lead and create more leaders. Building teams in our organization does not take responsibility away from us to build leaders. When our organizations and our teams are populated by leaders, we shall be able to move on. And as I conclude, I share this wonderful quotation from Mariana Williams, and I'm not going to read it. You can read it. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. That's what destroys organizations. Our deepest challenge is to build teams is that sometimes we do get frightened by other people's power. Our deepest challenge is sometimes forgetting to know that every individual is brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. Our deepest failure in building teams and sustaining organizations is when we forget that everyone, whatever religion you believe in, we are all made by the creator with gifts that are given to us, not to be held by ourselves, but to be used to empower others, to enlighten others. How we create teams is when we are able to know that our duty as individuals is to make everybody shine because we are all born to manifest the gifts that the creator has given to us. And these gifts are in everyone. And when we make these gifts light up or shine, we shall be able to unconsciously make our teams and members of our team to shine collectively. And when we are liberated, they too become liberated from our own fear. And our presence will automatically liberate others. This is a powerful quotation that was said by Madiba in 1994 in his first speech in parliament when he became the first black president of the country. That demonstrate what was in his mind and in his wish and in his heart. Let's go on and create teams. Thank you. <laughs>